The Girl Who Chased Away Sorrow The Diary of Sarah Nita, a Navajo Girl New Mexico, 1864 Written by Anne Turner We sleep outside in the snow. A soldier yells some words, I guess his command, to other soldiers. Meanmouth hurries around from group to group like a young sheepdog full of his own importance. Lie down, all of you, for the night. Wrap up in your blankets by the fire. Sleep out in the open? Grandmother grumbles. Are these people human beings? Patting her arm, Grandfather says that if we bundle ourselves up in all of our blankets and huddle close to the fire, we will survive. But I worry about starlight. The soldiers have put up tents and have protection from the fierce winds of the high country. But we have nothing. Grandfather tells us where to sleep beside the fire and to lie close to each other. Aunt and her baby are in the middle. On one side of her are Uncle, my other aunt, Slim Woman, and High Jumper. On the other side are Partridge Girl, Kaiba, and me, with Grandmother and Grandfather last. The rest of our group completes the circle around the fire, huddled in blankets like us. I can hear Desba coughing as we settle down. I wish my grandmother would be in the middle, where it is warmest, but she gives me a fierce look, pointing her finger at the ground where I should lie. So we unroll our sheepskins from home and curl up by the fire. I put part of my sheepskins over grandmother's bony legs and hug her tightly. My granddaughter, she says softly. I am glad to be someone's granddaughter on this high land with the wind biting my cheeks and the stars like fierce white eyes above. A cold nose at night. It is too cold to sleep, and I wish I had a roof over me. I remember how Coyote ruined the pattern of the stars in the sky, scattering the mica pieces here and there. If only someone were awake to tell me a story. When I turn over, bumping Kaiba and Grandmother, Something chilly pokes my cheek. With a yelp, I jump up, ready to grab a burning stick from the fire. But the creature bowing before me, grinning and wagging his tail, is not a wolf. It's Silvercoat! Now Kaiba is awake, and she throws her arms around our dog, hugging him close. Grandmother grumbles sleepily that all the freezing air is getting under her blanket. So, carefully, we tuck the blankets around us, telling our dog to lie at our feet. Kaiba whispers that he must have followed us from the canyon, maybe afraid of all the blue soldiers and the noise. But he's here, and tomorrow I'll worry about how to feed him. Now I can sleep, with my feet warm from his body, knowing that something from home is with Kaiba and me once more. The goat is stupid. In the gray light of morning, I look around at the huddled shapes by the dying fire. Grandmother is already awake, rubbing her face and slapping her arms against her body. I am so stiff that I stumble when I get to my frozen feet. But if I step on them hard, the feeling comes back to them. Silvercoat bows to each member of our family in turn, and everyone remarks on what a brave, clever dog he is for finding us. We are lucky that the soldiers let Grandmother bring her goats along. While others are eating the food from the soldiers, she milks the two goats, collecting the liquid in the metal pot she brought with her. Mixed with some ground corn, we have mush for breakfast. And it tastes so good. This is our food, not the white man's food. Only, I wish for some of that coffee they gave us last night. At the sound of the bugle, that's what we've learned it's called, we start out again marching in a line with some soldiers ahead and some behind. I see Hotface ahead, with his wild red hair sticking out from his hat, and nearby is the tall, lean form of the man I call Micah Eyes. They are the only ones I can tell apart. 
For these Bilagana all look alike to me with hair all over their faces like wolves. I herd the goats, using a knotted rope, while Kaiba and High Jumper keep the sheep together. But that bad goat, the black and white one, keeps stopping to graze, pawing at the snow and ripping up the dried hunks of grass. After the fifth time I hit her, she bucks, gives me a mean look, and bounds away. As I chase after her, Silvercoat dashes ahead. But I stop at a soldier's shout. Does he think I'm running away? I drop to the ground and clap my hands over my ears as he shouts again. Horses' hooves pound past me as he races behind the goat and hurts her back to us. He's helping me instead. I run up and hit the goat's rump while Silvercoat nips her twice on each leg. Between us, we bring her back to Grandmother's side. Nodding to the soldier, I try to thank him, though I have no words he can understand. When Kaiba smiles at him and he smiles back, I see that it is the thin soldier I call Micah Eyes. Pretty sister, don't smile at him. He could hurt us. She looks puzzled, not understanding me. But, Serenita, even among enemies there can be a friend. She repeats one of Mother's sayings. I wonder, and do not answer. I make a friend. The girl in our group who eats with us comes up to me and asks if she can walk with me. When I nod, she tells me her name is Sani, and that she has twelve summers, just like me. She is a little smaller than I am, with thin wrists sticking out from her ragged gray blanket. With uncombed hair hanging about her face, it is hard to see her eyes, but her voice is gentle and kind. The two other boys in our group are her younger brothers, and I have not heard them say a word. Maybe they are too frightened. I was afraid when I saw the soldier riding after you, Sani says. I tell her that my insides felt like water. But Kaiba reminds me that her soldier, now he is her soldier, is a nice person, not full of dark winds the way High Jumper thinks all white people are. Sani does not agree or disagree with my sister, but just asks if I notice that our names start with the same sound. Like the wind she says. Then she wonders if I have made my first rug yet. I will not tell her how many times I had to rip out the wool and start over. So we talk of making rugs, the colors and patterns we like, and the songs we sing when weaving. She was using the cloud ladder pattern in her rug, and so was I. The right song is important, she says, to make the weaving right. Son echoes inside me. And I think of how words and music join us together, how they can heal a sick person, how they can make corn grow. Suddenly I wonder, is there a song that will help us reach the end of our journey? We reach the fort. On the fourth day of our journey, we march over the flat land beside tall mountains. The wind is cruel here seeming to gain speed as it spins off the mountains and whirls down on us. I don't know how Sani's grandparents are surviving, but somehow they do. My grandparents help when they can, and High Jumper walks beside Desba, shouldering her weight, for she is having trouble keeping up. Then the land narrows down as we enter a valley with low hills around it. The place of soldiers, the fort, people call out excitedly. Maybe we will have a chance to rest and get warm. Below are lawn buildings, like dark old bones. Soldiers are marching and blowing on those foolish bugles. Horses stamp and mules bray, while all around on the low hills are so many of our people. They look like flocks of sparrows in the snow. More than I can count on my hands, Kaiba said. Do you think... She's afraid to say the words and I am afraid to finish for her. My heart beats faster, and under the sheepskin that is around my shoulders I begin to sweat. What if our family isn't here? Shouting and urging their horses on, the soldiers try to move us faster toward the fort. We gather enough strength to walk more quickly. Noise swirls around me like clouds. Sheep bleating, dogs barking, babies crying. 
and families calling out greetings to our people who are already here. The soldiers have to ride closer to keep us together. Hotface is shouting strange words at us. Sit down! Sit down! The Nakai tells us to sit on the hills so we can be counted. No one can understand why they would want to do this, and I can hardly wait until they are done. Finally they are, and I ask Grandmother if I can go looking for my mother and father. Of course, my child, go look. May you find them. She has already sent High Jumper and Partridge Girl off to search for wood to make a fire. But I wonder if any wood is left with so many Dene camping here. Holding hands, Sister and I go from group to group. Have you seen Lon Mustache of the Bitter Water People? Kaiba asks softly. And Glimpa of the Salt People? We are gripping hands so tightly that our nails are digging into our palms. But people shake their heads, smiling sadly. One man reminds me that many of us have lost relatives. But I don't want to hear his words and walk swiftly on. Again and again we ask, looking into people's faces, waiting to hear the words we yearn to hear. All afternoon we climb up and down the hills, threading through the crowds camped outside the fort. Some have made blanket tents that lean into the wind. One shelter has a fresh cowhide for a roof. Another family managed to dig out a small hole in the slant of a hill. But no one has seen our family. No one has heard of them. One woman tells us that the soldiers took an earlier group of Navajos to another fort. A place far away by a river, she adds. A place called the Bosque Redondo. Maybe a family was in that other group. Kaiba presses her head against my arm, mouthing those strange words. But I am so sad I can hardly comfort her. When I return, Grandmother looks up with a small smile, but it dies when she sees my face. Come, then. She holds out her arms. Get warm by the fire. High Jumper spreads a blanket for us to sit on. Silvercoat sits on my foot, and everyone gives us small pats and nods but all I can see is water dropping from my eyes onto the gray and brown blankets, making little pools, and I wonder if my family is even alive. They give us a strange white food. That night, the soldiers bring around our portion of beef, enough for the sixteen of us. Sani bites off small bits feeding Desba who is slumped, coughing by the fire. Our grandmother has given Desba one of our blankets, but I don't know if it is helping. The soldier gives us some white powder in a metal container and makes some motions with his hands, saying a word that sounds like a horse sneezing. Flar! What is he saying? Aunt wonders. We are having trouble hearing as starlight cries and wails at Aunt's breast. Maybe the baby can't get enough milk. I don't know what to do with this food, Grandmother complains. Should we cook it like our cornmeal, or eat it the way it is? Dipping my hand into it, I lick it off my fingers. It makes me cough, it is so dry and dusty. We wonder if it is some kind of earth the white men dug up, or something from a tree. Aunt tells me to add some water from her gourd, and I steer the white dust into a paste. Put it on the fire, Grandmother says, and I set it over the coals. Kaiba looks around and tells us that other people are doing the same thing, cooking up the white dust in metal containers or eating it plain from their hands. How do you know when it is cooked? Slim Woman wonders. Maybe we need to add some wood ashes. She tosses in a handful of juniper ash, the way we would when making corn mush. When I peer in, the flour does not look cooked. It is a soupy mush. But food must not be wasted, so we all have some to eat. Though Grandfather spits it out and wipes his mouth against his sleeve, and Uncle frowns as he chews. Aunt seems to like it best, and finishes what we cannot. I think we had this back when I was little, but I don't remember very well, he says. 
If Kaiba and I are going to survive, to find our mother and father again, we must eat, even if we hate the food. Uncle makes us tense. That night, after eating our food, Uncle decides that we must not sleep out in the open anymore. Now that we are staying in one place, we can make some kind of shelter. He sends the four of us children off to gather long poles. But it takes us almost until darkness to find them. There is not much wood left nearby, and we have to travel over the hills to collect some long sticks. When we come back, Grandfather and Uncle have already made eight holes in the earth, holding burning sticks to the soil to unfreeze it. Seen in a sound of house building, Uncle forces the poles deep into the ground, then beckons Grandmother to bring her blankets. We are lucky that she has extra ones with her, unlike some of our people who seem to have none. Grandmother and my two aunts strape the blankets over the poles, stitching them in place with some threaded sinew. As the sun sets, the red light falls on our two shelters. Tonight, we will be warm. My aunt is sick. For the first time in days, we sleep as soon as our heads touch the rugs beneath. Now the stars cannot look down on me like fierce eyes. Now the wind is outside. But some time in the night, I feel a cold breeze when the blanket is pushed open. Someone is being sick. The harsh sounds coming through the blankets. When I crawl out into the night, afraid it is grandmother, aunt is clutching her stomach and moaning. The Bilagana food... It is bad for our stomachs. I get her some water and help her back to her place inside our tent. Starlight is fast asleep, curled under the gray blanket. If she is to live and survive, we must make sure that Aunt has enough to eat. Otherwise, her milk will dry up and Starlight will have nothing to eat. There must be a way to cook this new food. I will watch tomorrow and see if the soldiers eat it. And if they do, how they do it. Kaiba and I learned about flour. Aunt is having trouble nursing Starlight again, as the baby wails and kicks her feet. Grandmother thinks that is because Aunt is not getting enough food. You have to have a full belly to make milk for your baby, says Grandmother in a bitter voice, fanning the fire with the end of her blanket. Before Shani is awake and her family unwrapped from their coverings, Kaiba and I walk through the camp, looking at people around their fires. How are they cooking this new food? I see one woman stirring the dust in a metal pot, making a sour mouth. It tastes terrible, doesn't it? I ask, and she agrees. Kaiba thinks we are cooking it the wrong way, and the woman nods, but how? Down through the camp we wander, watching, looking, but no one seems to know how to prepare this food, and others have been sick during the night. One man wonders if the white men are trying to poison us. Hurrying, Kaiba and I go down to one of the buildings of the fort. I know that my mother would hate to see me trying to learn from the Bilagana, but she is not here. Pulling her hair around her face as if it could hide her, Kaiba steps more and more slowly. Quietly, carefully as deer moving through shadows, we stalk one of the buildings. Bodies of animals are hanging from the roof of the building, a terrible smell coming through the door. We hurry on to another building, where men in blue were stirring things in big pots on huge metal boxes. Like giants, sister, Kaiba whispers to me. Then I hear one of them laugh as he sees us hiding near the doorway. We try to dart away, but he runs after us and grabs Kaiba's hand. When I look, it seems I am looking up and up and up. He is so tall. Then I see his lean face. He only has hair under his nose and his gray, glittering eyes. It is Kaiba's soldier. I tug on her other hand, but he will not let her go. My little sister is braver than me, for she opens her mouth and asks, Flower? He takes us inside the building and points to a soldier who is mixing the white dust with water in a big wooden bowl, punching it down and rolling it over. Micah Eyes pulls off a piece and offers it to Kaiba, who grimaces and waves her hand. No. 
Laughing, her soldier flattens the food with his hand and tosses it into a pan to cook on the huge metal box. He turns it over, blows on it to cool it, and offers it again to us. Sister holds it up to her nose, smells it, and takes a tiny bite. This time Kaiba smiles. Try it, Serenita! It is good! I hold it to my nose and breathe in. It does not smell like our food, of the forest, the earth, the animals. Like silver coat nipping at a snake, I dart at it and take a quick bite. How could Kaiba think this is good? But it is food. And now that we know what to do, we both smile and nod and turn away from Micah eyes. Giving Kaiba a little push with his hand, he says a funny word. Scoot nug. Scoot nug, we say to each other smiling. Scoot nug! Running up the hill. The Story of Skutnu That word with its funny sounds makes my head whirl. Other words come darting in like little foxes trying to squeeze inside a den all at once. Skutnu was a little fox, I tell sister, who slows at the top of the hill. She lived with her three brothers and two sisters in a nice sandy den at the foot of a juniper. We sit down near one family as I tell the story. But Skutnu wished to be something else. She did not want fur that had to be licked. She hated her bushy tail that got caught in the cracks of tree trunks. She wanted to be a goose, with a long, beautiful neck who sailed on a shining river. One night, she went to see a medicine man, asking if he had any medicine to change her form. He told her that only bad people wanted to change their shapes and to go away. Dragging her tail, Skutnu went back to her den. She played with her brothers and sisters, but not as much as before. When father brought meat for her, she would hardly nibble it. She grew thinner and thinner, until she looked like a wisp of gray smoke. And no pleading of her mother and father could get her to eat. On a night of the full moon, she wobbled out of the den. Not far away was a waterhole that held a shimmer of white water. Staring at it, Skutnu went forward, wishing as hard as she could to be a goose. One step, two. Her paws left the dry ground and rested in the cool water. As she dropped her body under the water, her head sank onto her breast, which was suddenly round and smooth. With a quick shake, her tail disappeared and became long gray feathers. When she opened her beak to thank the gods, a wild sound flew out. Beating her wings, she rose up, up from the water into the night sky. She seemed to be riding on moonlight, cool under her body. Again she cried her wild call, Free! Free! I paused for a moment, the words swirling in my head. And that is the way we will be one day, like that goose, free in our land again. Kaiba leans against me as people call out and sigh. An elder weeps, pressing her sleeve to her eyes, repeating the word, free. Like the call of a wild goose, the word flies around me, off into the gray sky. Kaiba and I cook flour. When we reach our group, Kaiba tells me that my stories make her strong, that they make her legs move over the ground. They make my bones strong too, and I wonder if this gift of telling stories is part of the inside wind that my uncle told me about. At the end of the day, Kaiba and I plan our big surprise. We are all sitting in a group, the way the soldiers order us to, waiting for our portion of beef. Desba is sitting straighter now, looking stronger. I think she did not eat the strange white food, so she did not get sick. Sani's father still looks hard and angry and I have hardly heard him say two words. Maybe I should tell him the story about Worried Girl, and how she changed into the girl who chased away sorrow. When the soldier gives Grandfather a big, thick hunk of meat, we can hardly wait. Shani's two brothers lean forward and touch the beef, licking their fingers. Sharply, Grandmother tells them to wait, that Grandfather must say a prayer first. After we gulp down our meat, 
saving some for silver coat. Kaiba and I mix a little water with the flour, stirring it in the middle of the pot. I ask High Jumper to pull two flat rocks onto the coals, and Sister and I press some of the dough onto the rocks to cook. We turn it over, waiting, until both sides are brown, then break it into pieces and offer it around. Hmm, Grandmother sighs. This is better. Not as dusty. At first, Aunt is afraid to eat, but we tell her it will not make her sick cooked this way, that even the soldiers eat it. You need the food for starlight, Kaiba says in a grown-up voice. Gently, she rubs the baby's cheek and sings a little song to her. High Jumper smiles at me when I hand him his food, and I feel warm inside that I can help his family. They have given so much to Kaiba and me that I am happy to give something back. I cannot be patient. I ask Grandfather when we will leave for the fort by the river as I step from foot to foot, hating the way my dirty woolen dress scratches my skin above the leggings. He rests a hand on my head. I do not know the soldier's plan for us, Serenita. We will have to be patient. I have seen them getting wagons ready, putting things in the back under those white covers. Maybe soon. Patient. Didn't my mother say I was like a little goat that had to be pulled by a rope? Didn't she always wonder how my hair got like tangled yarn, asking why I forgot to wash my face with snow in the winter? I did try to remember. I saw my two aunts scooping up snow to rub on their faces. Even Kaiba remembers to rub snow on her face, tries to run her fingers through her hair. Is that why Micah Eyes likes her? Because she is almost clean and has a gentle face? I know I do not look gentle. I look stormy and angry. But I think that that is how I will survive the time of soldiers. High Jumper is restless too. High Jumper comes up to me, brushing his hair back from his forehead. He is sooty and unwashed, like all the rest of us, and tries to keep clean by scrubbing his face with snow, but it just streaks the dirt. He says that he cannot be patient either, and that he has been talking to some other boys who are planning to run away one night soon. I look around quickly. No one seems to hear. Grandmother tells us to find some wood for the fire. Or if we can't find wood, to gather some dried dung. Together we walk down to the camp building, searching the grounds for fuel. But everyone else is doing the same thing. We look like birds pecking in a cornfield, heads bobbing up and down. You would not run away, would you? I ask quietly as High Jumper seizes a piece of wood near a building. I don't know. He tells me he hates living all pushed together with so many of our people, and that he doesn't trust the blue soldiers, even though they are feeding us. There is nothing to do except wait. Yet, he doesn't want to leave his grandfather and grandmother. His foot taps the ground, and I think of a horse about to bolt. How can I persuade him to stay? The thought of him running off through the snow with no food frightens me. But all I can say is... It would be dangerous, High Jumper. What if the soldiers chase after you, or shoot you? He does not answer, and we return to camp with two pieces of wood and one bit of dried dung. They hurt us like sheep. Aunt shreds up the last of the cliff rose bark we could find, stuffing it under Starlight's bottom. Soon the baby is wrapped and in her cradle board, and High Jumper lifts her onto Aunt's back, settling the blanket around Aunt's shoulders. He offers to carry Starlight when Aunt gets tired, and she gives him a gentle smile. That strange yelping sound comes from the bugle, and our people start moving like a river down the low hills along the plain. Behind me, Sani and her mother help support Desba while her two brothers dart in and out of the line. Her father is silent, as always, with a fierce look on his face. Kai puts her hands over her ears at the sound of horses stamping and whining, soldiers shouting, or people coughing, and babies crying until their mothers put them in their cradle boards and tuck them under blankets and shawls. 
if they have them. As a gritty snow starts falling, we duck our heads and set our feet toward the place of the rising sun. It feels like freezing dust, Kaiba says between her teeth. I, I hope this does not keep up all the way. I look at her. Her cheeks are a little fuller now, after our time at the fort, and she doesn't look quite so thin. But I still worry about how she will make this long journey ahead of us. Whistling to our dog, I grip Kaiba's hand in my left and Partridge Girl's in my right, and I'm glad of the sheepskin over my back. Oh, my mother, my father, will you be there to greet us? Will I ever sit next to my father again as he pretends to be a squirrel, scampering up my arm, searching for nuts in my hair? <laughs>